Like I mentioned in my last video, I'm working on several different pieces right now. So if you guys are interested in a particular section, I'm going to put the timestamps over here and in the link below so you can find exactly what you're looking for. I don't know if any of you musicians have these pieces that it seems like no matter how much you practice them, you can never get really comfortable with it or there's always some kind of tension. This is one of those pieces for me. And I think one of the reasons is because I had so much conflicting advice from various teachers going through my head. And I always approach this piece from a very technical standpoint, talking about things like the thumb or the rotations or arm movement, how to stay fluid. Some people say it's all in the wrist and staying light in the wrist. But it seems like no matter what I did, there was just always tension and I could never really play it with a lot of accuracy or confidence. So I haven't worked on this piece for years because of that fact. Now that I'm a bit more comfortable in my own approach to these things, I tried to do it in a different way. So to avoid getting overly technical, I just tried to simplify it as much as I possibly could. There's these series of arpeggios, of course, and I just tried to make a constant crescendo from the bottom to the top and then decrescendo back down. And I eliminated these accents on the pinky. So it ends up something like... So the reason I'm eliminating the pinky is because it's very easy to... to just play in these little segments. And I'm trying to keep the length of the line. You can always add in those accents at the end. But if you practice a lot of times when I hear this piece, it's very, very mechanical. And then as I progress through it, there are certain areas where I might want to change the dynamics or he might have it particularly. Rather than crescendoing for two measures, I might want to crescendo for four measures. So up and down. And I might want to change the direction. Also, the reason I'm trying to do this is to eliminate all the tension and to just simply focus on the sound. And by doing that, I realize certain things. For instance, one of the parts that would always trip me up is this part right there going back to the pinky. I think because it breaks pattern, where before it just goes up to the top and then down. This goes up to the top and then has a jump back from the thumb to the pinky. So this part right here. I would miss this a lot or feel tense or feel something not quite right. And when I just focused on the sound, I realized that I was coming early on this pinky. And so that made me think just in terms of timing, that I, I needed more time than I thought. So by making the little switch of thinking I have more time than I think, um, I'm able to take time, actually it ends up being a lot more effective, where before I was focusing on the movement itself, like I was trying to dial back in the rotation, thinking, okay, no, I'm going too far here, or I'm not going far enough, maybe I should, you know, lean more. Just by thinking about the time, it's, it seemed like the issues began to fix themselves. Which leads me to a huge practice tip that I tell all of my students, and I keep saying it because so few people actually do it, but one of the best ways you can get better at piano is by simply filming yourself. Just do it! And not just filming yourself every once in a while or when you're about to give a recital, but film yourself all the time. I can't tell you how much I learned from doing these vlogs, and even previously before doing the vlogs, just filming like eight measures or half a page and listening back because it's never how you think it sounds in your head. There's always some differences. There's always something that you didn't notice because you're not involved in all the mechanics of playing. And so you're just able to kind of take a third person view, a little more objective view of your music. And of course the reason we hate it is because usually it makes us feel bad. We're like, oh, I didn't realize it sounded that weird. <laughs> Better to sound weird on your phone, in a practice room, or at home than on stage.
It's still a work in progress, but it's getting better. It's a lot more fluid than before, and I'm, I'm beginning to, to notice the particular measures, the particular shapes, like this one, still giving me some trouble. I'll be working on that. This piece, I find, is just a lot of fun to play. Um, for Rachmaninoff, it is, maybe I'd say, one of his most joyous pieces? I might use that word. It just seems very festive with the sound of these huge bells. And, I don't know, you just get to play with a lot of pedal, this huge wash of sound. I want to use this as a program starter. I feel like it would be a pretty energetic start to a program. Right from the very beginning, you have this huge leaps, and you can tell he had huge hands. What takes me a lot of movement would be, everything would be less movement scaled to his hand size. One thing that I do to get this bell sound is places like this. You, I might even hold the pedal the entire time. Maybe a little bit of release just to, to not sound so muddy. My goal here is just to have a huge wash of sound without it being harsh in any way. And of course, being Rachmaninoff, he always finds some way to find lyricism and insert it into the middle of even pieces like these. I'm still, unfortunately, not at the point where I can play this up to full speed. But more or less what I want it to sound like, and this would be played with one hand, but for the sake of the demonstration, I'm going to play it with two. The melody starts here in the middle voice, which would be like the tenor voice. continues so so characteristic of Rachmaninoff when you think it's going to end he keeps pushing it somewhere so at the end of this and then we're back into something a little bit more da dum da dum da dum but there are just so many notes in the right hand, and I'm trying not to make it sound very busy. I'm trying to make it sound, or maybe not atmospheric, but just sparkles on top of what's going on in the melody, which is really the core of what we want to hear. Now, there are a few places in this piece where I, I couldn't roll the chord in a way that didn't sound chopped up. And again, that is because of hand size. So I chose to eliminate a few, a few notes here or rearrange certain chords. Like I just decided not to play this bass note. So the reason I chose to reorder this chord is because he, he's asking you to do this. And it just takes so much time with my, with his hand, he could have done it like this probably. That's just not comfortable for me. So the way I redid it, I simply left this F out because if you look at the chord, the F is already played here. And it's more important to me to keep the lyricism. So you have to make those kinds of compromises in certain places. And then in the next bar, I chose to do it again and for the same reason to continue the lyrical line. So what he's asking for is this.
which sounds great if you can reach all those keys like he could. But this is what I've chosen to do instead. So I'm missing the initial bass. However, he plays it a triplet later. And I think it's better to sound like this than this. There's just no way to get to roll that chord fast enough and to keep it legato from this G if you have to jump. 